Hi, welcome to the bathtub. It's the old masturbator, Scott Bradfield. The old masturbator's dog, Lucky the Wonder Dog. I'm not picking her up. She gets just too snappish sometimes. But um, hopefully we'll be, she'll be making some more appearances soon. And uh, we're talking today. We're doing, a, uh, we're doing quite a few of these today because we've had a pretty hectic couple of weeks. Hoping today's to settle down a little bit. Um, we've lost the Raphael glow. We lost that certain pitch, that certain period of the day when the Irish hills come beaming off me like a Raphael glow. And it's more of an R. Crumb kind of messy reality kind of thing we got here. Kind of ugly, the ugly reality of the world. But that's okay. It's all the masturbator. That's all we do here. We're going to talk about, um, we're doing one of our, we, when I had, had a really tough time with old Lucky keeping up and worried about her, and uh, which we're continuing to be. She, uh, I did lots of comfort reading. So we, we did, uh, I did lots of uh, vintage paperback. It's a vintage paperback SF roundout, roundabout. No. Round, no. Vintage paperback. SF. Hodgepodge. It's a hodgepodge. It's not a roundabout. That's a hodgepodge. We don't even know what the hell we're doing here. Anyway, I did. I read a bunch of vintage SF paperbacks from my old collection. I love collecting these old books, and, and, and I've kept many of these for many decades and many decades, and I'm just going to talk through them pretty quickly. And again, this is the, the theme show you never thought you knew, you ne never thought you needed until we provided it. You never, it's like we're the Pringles. This is the Pringles of literary book tubing. We uh, we provided something. We no one wanted it. No one wanted a Pringle. They got it, and then they, I can't stop eating them. So I don't know about you guys. Anyway, what do we do? We've done a lot of different types of books here, and one I one I enjoyed the most, possibly the one I enjoyed the most. It's not as good a novel as one of the other books, but it's uh, Frederick Pohl and C. M. Cornbluth's Gladiator at Law. We've talked about Cornbluth. We've talked about Frederick Pohl. We've talked about the two of them. And I've never read this one. I, I have to say I, re I enjoyed them when I was younger. I, as I've as I've talked about in some previous round in, in previous hodgepodges, it's a hodgepodge, not a roundabout. Don't ever can make that mistake. The same mistake I did. You look like an idiot. The hodgepodge in the past. Cornbluth is one of these writers who, when I was young, I loved him. I love him as I get older, and he died too young. And every time you read him, you think, "Why this guy? This guy was just getting started." Especially his great short stories, his greatest short stories. The books he writes with Pohl, including his most famous one, *The Space Merchants*, are very good. They have a lot of; they're really very funny. They remind me a lot of the the influence on Sheckley is pretty clear when you read these books, and the vision of this kind of nightmarish America extended into the future is pure Sheckley. I'm sure Sheckley learned from them, and. But the books are a little bit hot. They're a bit, bit of a mess, and they're clearly written for money and written quickly. But I did really enjoy this book. It's, it's, uh, it is like many of the Pole novels and many of the Cornbluth and Pole novels about a couple of people who are kind of middle of the one guy's some corporate executive. I forget what he does. Another guy's a lawyer, a hack lawyer, and they're both in the middle of this kind. Of, these, you see, there's actually these. I love these little covers. They live in these big bubble cities above above the world. So the world has become this huge, ugly suburb of just crime and just poverty and horrors. And then all the, all the well-off people live up in here. And if they do anything wrong, they get tossed out into the streets, basically, <laughs> which is basically what, what America is today. <laughs> Let's face it. Anyway, so there's a lawyer in it, and there's a guy who's a, who's a, he's a corporate executive who, who stages now I remember. It's been a couple of weeks since I read it. He stages these big gladiator combats. It's kind of Hunger Games. It was 100 years before, 60 years before those terrible Hunger Games books. Once a year, they have these big kind of Hunger Games spectaculars to get everybody involved, and they and they go out and root and scream and shout and forget their miserable lives. And they have, like, like great... They have one thing where they have old men and women fighting <laughs> in the opening, and, and they'll have all these different types of stage defense, and then everybody goes out there just killing each other. It's it's that comes up at the end of the book. This guy works. One of the guys works for this corporation that helps stage the things. And for some reason, they're, they're tossing him out at the beginning. He basically he gets screwed over by one of his, the people he works with or one of his rivals. And he gets him and his wife all have to go live down in the suburbs. And like in many of their books, and particularly Paul does this, too. We sort of follow him into the dregs of this, this society where they have to live in the suburbs. And the suburbs are just nightmares. They're just run by these all teenage gangs. There's teenage girl gangs, and they have to they're thrown out in the street in this horrible world. And this and one of the funny parts of the book is the guy who gets thrown out in the street with his family, 
actually becomes pretty like a tough guy. He becomes like he starts to succeed down there where he was really a failure upstairs. And the other guy's a lawyer who's who's trying to help a woman and her brother who 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 had the rights, their rights to certain structures and certain architecture have been stolen from them. Anyway, that's that's his his tale. And it's a terrific book. It's really fun. I, I again like a lot of these kind of this type of book. It tended to lose a little energy near the end. Dodo, you got your coconut. We in the last episode we saw you last couple of episodes you saw her new coconut. There's your new coconut. Lucky's left. So if you want to come out, I'll let you out for a bit. Lucky's gone downstairs. She comes up and down. Come on. Come on out. You can be good. I don't have to wear I don't have to wear my socks because of you, do I? Huh? You wanna say hi to everybody? Are you gonna poo on me probably? Probably. Say hi. Okay, you go you go down on my head. Not on my head, but you go down here. I was gonna read a very short passage, which is about how this book is written in the fifties. And it's about how people get yanked into the suburban, these suburban uh, housing projects and spend the rest of their lives in debt. This is a little story about Belle Reve. This is the name of one of the suburbs here. Belle Reve receded before them always like a mirage. The four color circulars continued to arrive and the statements of a down payment balance due. They, they bought into this suburb and eventually they're waiting for their product, their house to be built and they're paying every month. So they're, ba they have, they're paying every month and it says plus title search fee, plus handling charge, plus interest, plus legal fee, plus sewer assessment, plus land tax, plus road tax. They paid and they kept paying. Time passed. The house was built. The hour had struck. The kids wailed, is that it? And began to cry. Whichever was weaker, the wife or husband sagged shoulders and stared in horror at the sea of mud. The minute house riding it like an ark, like one ark in a fleet of identical arcs drawn up rank by rank for review by a snickering deity. Whichever was stronger, the husband or wife, squared shoulders and said loudly, it may not look like much now. But give us a few weekends, and we'll have it just like the demonstration place. And we'll be working for ourselves, not some landlord. This place is an expense. It's an asset. It's about these, these, these hardworking couples getting yanked into these rip-off uh, projects. And, of course, the there's always there's two stages in these, these characters' lives. One, they feel like they're in control of the world, and they're winning, or they're dis defeat. And I, Kornbluth and Pohl write really well about that defeat. That sense of defeat is some of these these poor bastards who got who believed what they shouldn't have believed. Um, it it made me want to read John Brother's Stand on Zanzibar. I've had this since I was sixteen. It was a Hugo Award winner. It's very big, very long. I've tried starting it many times over over the decades, especially when I was a kid, and I thought I was kind of looking forward to it this time. He does a lot about the language and the, the style, the vernacular of this futuristic society. It sounds a little bit like Clockwork Orange. Frankly, I've always hated Clockwork Orange. I read it twice. I didn't like it either times. And it has that feel of this kind of glitzy, futuristic language. And I got 20 pages and I gave up. Sorry. That's the best. I, I, I'll try it again someday. I know a lot of people like it. has written a lot of good stuff and stuff I liked. Then I went on, I read a little, a little Ron Goulart. We've talked about Ron Goulart. And... I read this in about, you know, I was so worried about Lucky and we were so wound up. This is, this, these are the sort of books. A Ron Goulart novel you should be able to read in about two hours. They're really short. They're like 160 pages. They're very lots of short chapters. They're really good, fun, glitzy, silly science fiction comedy. And uh, I couldn't get into it. I, I, oh, I had trouble reading it, but it was really good. So I had trouble getting reading it, but I read it, but I read it and I enjoyed it. There was one passage. It, it the this is the second is one I take that back. There's a whole series of books, but this is this is a sort of a sequel to one called Death Cell. This Death Cell came out in 1971. I did not read it, but it's summarized in this. This comes out in 72. It's the old Beagle paperbacks. It's not on. A, it's not these beautiful books. Even if I didn't like the book, I would think those are, those are, those are worth having. Look at these. These are all beagle. I think I think they were connected with Valentine. I'm not sure. They're a little crummier looking, little 
Oh, they looked a little bit more uh, proletarian than the, the beautiful, glossy Valentine volumes. But this was very funny, and the, the premise is that it's about, he's a, I think he's a journalist, and he goes around ex, doing exposés, and he does, does an expose on this lizard planet, where there's, those are the lizards, and they run the, they run the planet. And uh, it's very funny. The parts that really made me laugh, even though I was depressed. This, this is a very brief part, which is page 105. And I'm trying to read a little passage. I won't be able to do all of these. But there's a, a bunch. It's, it's kind of like a cowboy country, part of the, part of the planet, a bunch of cowboys. And they run around, and they have the, the bad guys. There's a lot of bushwhackers and outlaws. And they have a convention. This sounds, it's a little bit like a pension section. It reminded me of Thomas Pynchon quite a bit. And they go for a, they have a special convention where they all come together and have panel discussions about how to bushwhack people. It's pretty funny. I'm just going to read a short passage from it. Um, Merle Hokanson stood in the dusty sundown main street of Goresville, reading the convention program over again. She it, he said. They don't seem to have got hardly no free time set aside for shooting up and torturing straight John people at all this year. Just what Collie says, observed Luke, with one hand clutching the tied up of Palmer's arm. They've got one of the heroes uh, tied up. Like right about now, said Merle, jabbing a pudgy finger at the roughly printed program sheet. What do they got scheduled? 6 p.m. Panel discussion, new methods of dry gulching. Is the old style bushwhacker outmoded? Panelists include the Yuba Kid, Yolo Kid, the Sunset Kid, Black Bob, and the Chapa Valley Kid. <laughs> now, what is the hoot in hell do these mooncalf dudes, dudes know about dry gulching? That discussion's been postponed until 7 o'clock, I hear, said Glenn, returning from a circuit of the small wo wooden building town. How come? Somebody dry gulched the Yolo Kid on his way here, and the committee's got to round themselves up a substitute. They're very episodic novels. The plots are the uh, are tissue paper thin. And they just, but he always knows how to start set something up and then deliver the punchline in the plot. And there's a series of very funny comic series. I I really enjoyed. I enjoyed it, and I picked up a couple more. I have piles of them left sitting around the house. Finally, one of my favorite writers, Brian Aldiss. We've talked about him not enough here. I've often compared him because him and he and J.G. Ballow were kind of similar. They both came into science fiction right after World War II. They started published in some of the, most of the conventional SF magazines in, in post-World post -World War II England. And then when New Worlds came along and Michael Moorcock, they kind of they adapted to the currents. They're always changing. They're always coming up with new ideas and ways of telling stories. And Oldest was really one of those fascinating. This is one of his more conventional books. It comes from 1950. It's called Greybeard. It probably, well, first printing 65. I want to say it's older than that. 64, okay, 1964. And it's about a world where the uh, some sort of nuclear explosion or accident of some sort has caused uh, everyone to become sterile. And it's nothing but old people wandering around. I felt like it was like my, my office. It was like me in my office here. Just a bunch of old people wandering around. And uh, they're, they're trying to find a purpose in life and the and the society the british society is sort of disintegrated and it's gone through periods where they've had like local you know kind of um, what you call them fascist sort of fascist local leaders running things and there's people out running around it looks like there's some there, there's a there's myths the stories about young children running around in the woods no one's seen a child in decades and it's uh it's a very moving kind of melancholy book. I like everything I've read of Oldis's. I don't think I've read anything I didn't like of his. And it's about this couple, a man whose nickname is Greybeard and his wife Martha, who've known each other since they were children. And it kind of does something I normally don't like, which is it tells you the story that's going forward in the future, this horrible future. And then it flashes back to long scenes from the beginning of the crisis to uh, Washington, D.C., where they're trying to take gather data about the crisis and so forth. Anyway, I'll just read a little passage. It, it's it's not quite as good as, as the great Hothouse novel or The Long Afternoon of Earth, I think it's called. It doesn't have that lush, continually inventive 
uh, brilliance of, of that novel. But it's almost as almost as enjoyable and almost as haunting. This is near the end of the book when they're started going off into the into the they're leaving behind their sort of safe so social networks and they're going off into the the wilderness a bit. I just read two paragraphs. Wildlife swarmed back across the earth as abundantly as it ever had. In its great Congress, there were a few phyla absent, but in numbers, the multitude was as rich as it had ever been. So most of the creatures have died off, but they're starting to come back, except for human beings. The earth had great powers of replenishment and would have as long as the sun maintained its present output of energy. It had supported many different kinds of life through many different ages, as far as that outcast spit of European mainland called the British Isles were concerned, its flora and fauna had never entirely regained the richness they enjoyed before the Pleistocene. During that period, the glaciers descended over much of the northern hemisphere, driving life southward before them, but the ice retreated again. Life followed it back towards its northern strongholds. Toward the end of the Pleistocene, like the opening of a giant hand, a stream of life poured across the land that had recently been barren, the ascendancy of man had only momentarily affected the copiousness of this stream. Now the stream was a great tide of petals, leaves, fur, scales, and feathers. A really kind of poetic uh, vision. Oldis writes very well about these kind of large uh, in, uh, ecological transformations of the earth. And he does this in some of the Heliconia novels and many of his books. Anyway, I'm a big fan of Oldis, and we'll keep reading him and in various ways, including the hodgepodge. Stay safe. Happy bathing. Take care of your pets, because someday they have to take care of you. We'll see you soon.